Uh, in this talk, we are uh, summarizing the results of uh, three papers that will appear uh, in the chat. They are all on the archive. But uh, to give an introduction, I will start a little bit slowly. Uh, so please ask questions in the chat and Joost uh, will try to answer them on the go. So hopefully many of you have heard of uh, Bernoulli nearest neighbor bond percolation on the integer lattice ZD. So this is a model uh, that has been int introduced uh, ooh, uh, very long ago, 1969, I think. So you take uh, vertices of ZD as your vertex set, and then you connect every nearest neighbor uh, with probability P. And you only connect them if they are nearest neighbor. So you get a graph that looks like this. So there are several research directions uh, relating this model. Uh, one that has been ga has gained a lot of inter interest is whether uh, the origin uh, has a path where you can walk to to infinity. Uh, so somehow the model was that you have a porous rock and if water enters the outside of the rock, whether the middle of the rock will be wet. Now, here on this picture, this is not the case. The cluster of the origin is highlighted in green. So generally, I will write theta p for the probability that the origin uh, is uh, connected to infinity by a path. Another way to express this is that uh, that zero is, uh, is part of uh, an infinite component. OK, so what is known here? Uh, is the first is what I'm going to focus on is explaining you supercriticality. So because the system is monotone in opening up more and more edges or just putting more and more edges in your model, um, there is a critical uh, probability PC uh, where the probability that, uh, so theta P, which was the probability that zero is connected to infinity, uh, starts to become uh, strictly positive. It's also known uh, that if P happens to be larger than this PC, then there is an infinite component, which is almost surely unique. So in, in this uh, picture, you can see a large component uh, inside of a box, but it's very likely that this component will just go, go, go on and on and will stay infinite. So for supercritical models, uh, so maybe before that, I have to mention that there is a lot of interest on critical models where P is equal to PC because this describes the phase transition. Uh, so you can see percolation as a microscopic model uh, uh, where you see macroscopic phenomena. But we will focus on supercritical models. And let me tell you our main questions of interest for this talk. So if you have a large box, uh, and I'm going to keep the volume of the box to be n, then the question is, how does the largest component behave in this box? So the, this blue component, what is its size? This is the first question people ask. and because the infinite component has density theta, uh, one would expect to see some low of large numbers type behavior when the largest component inside of the box has proportion theta. Uh, the second question you can ask, how does uh, the second largest component in a box look like? So that's this red one here. This is also fairly big, but how big can it be? And the third component, a third question is maybe large deviation events for the giant. How rare is it that the giant is too small? Here I also highlighted a, a, a fourth question that I didn't write, which is the component containing the origin. How big is that? Is it always infinite? What is the probability that it's large if it's not infinite? So here are the known results for this model. The law of large numbers does hold, so we can take this out. The second largest component in a box is actually logarithmic in the volume, 
with a specific power d over d minus one, then let me just write d equals the dimension. So in our case, when uh, d is two, then this is uh, log n to the two over one, so uh, log n squared. Uh, it's also known that uh, if um, you ask the what is the probability that the giant is too small, this, so it's less than rho times n for some rho, which is less than theta, uh, you get um, a decay. So the probability of that is e to the minus some constant times n to the d minus one over d. And I will put in an exclamation mark because this is a little bit confusing. This theta is not the limiting density. This is just that it's that order. So the or up to constant factor, up to constant factor. So it's a little bit of clash of notation here. And maybe one more thing that, that is important and it's known is the cluster size decay. So the probability that the origin is in a component which is finite, but large, larger than K, also decays stretched exponentially and the power is again d minus one over d. So what we see here and what we can notice that there is this magic power, d over d minus one is one over d minus, uh, d minus one over d. So there is this magic power, d minus one over d that drives the decay of these quantities, uh, these probabilities and the size of the second largest component. So then one can ask, okay, what kind of extensions uh, do, do exist of these results? And there are two main directions. One is for transitive graphs of polynomial growth. You can think of Cayley graphs of groups or other transitive graphs. And here, the main results establish uh, the, uh, the main questions I showed you. So low of large numbers, cluster size decay, maybe second largest component if you restrict to a finite domain, and that the power d minus one over d that drives everything remains. Here are some references. These are recent papers. So there is another main direction of extension that we picked up is to look at inhomogeneous percolation models. So I will explain in a second, what do I mean there? So here, I'm gonna drop the assumption that every edge is present with probability P. Uh, if you make the connection probabilities different, you are no longer restricted to uh, polynomial growth, which is a key ingredient in the proofs of um, uh, these, these results here. Uh, okay, so let's see. So how do we, so the, what I'm gonna show you next, how do we move towards inhomogeneous? Sorry, but what is CN1? CN2, you say, have a asymptotic, uh, just uh, yeah, before, before, yes. Yes, CN1. okay, so what? CN1, let me what? write it, let me, let me show you on this picture. CN1, good question, is oh. the largest component in a box. So you, you, you fix a box, uh -huh. of volume n and then you ask okay what is the size of the largest connected component inside this box that's uh, actually just the component itself is cn1 and the size i put uh, uh, this sign it is proved it's proved it's convergence the convergence yes. is proven yes this is proven okay thank you yeah thank you cn2 is the the second largest component. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to define now is, a mo is the model of long range percolation. Uh, this you can do either on ZD or on RD. So if you, if you want to work on ZD, your vertex set is ZD. But if you want to work on RD, you take your vertex set as a Poisson point process. And I'm going to make the assumption that the intensity is one. It's just Lebesgue intensity, homogeneous everywhere. Uh, other intensities are also okay, homogeneous ones or bounded 
density ones uh, because they can be scaled out. So what is the connection probability? That's uh, this one. I connect two vertices uh, with, with this formula, which is, uh, so you take the Euclidean distance x minus y norm, you raise it to the sum power d, and the connection probability gonna decay with this distance. So the farther you are, the less likely that two vertices will be connected, but it's never zero. So the exact connection probability is uh, p times beta over x minus y to the d. This can uh, to the this can be larger than one. This ratio, and then you have to chop it off. So then you take the um, the minimum. So this sign is here, the minimum. And then you raise it to a power alpha, which will be crucial. So let me explain each of the role of each of these parameters. So P is, is the percolation probability. This means that nearest a neighbor edges are not all present when P is strictly less than one. This beta here, this one, we call the spread out parameter because edges that have length less than beta to the one over d are all present with probability p. So you basically make the original percolation model a little bit more spread out. But there is also the alpha, this one, and that one we call the long range parameter. The long range parameter allows for long edges also to be present. Uh, and we, typically this ratio is of course less than one if x minus y norm tends to infinity. So if you have alpha small, then you don't punish so much these long edges. So you're gonna see lots of long edges in your model. If alpha is large, then most edges will be short. And a little bit more qualitatively, if alpha is less than one, then every node has actually infinite degree. So you have really a lot of long edges. If alpha is larger than one, then the degrees of vertices are almost surely finite. And the degree is just the number of, of uh, vertices connected to a certain degree of X connected to X by a direct edge. Okay, so, so this is one model where I allow uh, long edges. Now, I, but still the degrees happen to be still pretty homogeneous. So in, in my second model, I'm gonna make also the degrees very inhomogeneous. So I use a similar start. I start with a vertex set that's for simplicity. I'm just gonna take it for a Poisson point process on RD with Lebag measure as intensity. Then for each vertex, I sample a mark. So this mark is a, a hidden variable. I think about it as a mark representing the future degree or the future, future expected degree of the vertex. And this mark of V, I'm gonna sample it IID uh, with a density that is the density of a Pareto uh, distribution. So I have uh, W uh, is the mark and I raise it to a power minus tau. There's a normalization constant, which is tau minus one. It's not that relevant. And it's uh, every mark is, uh, is strictly positive without loss of generality. I can start it at one. So why do I work with this Pareto marks because Pareto distribution is very inhomogeneous. Even the variance can be infinite if tau is uh, between two and three or the mean can be also infinite. So, and the marks will mimic the degrees. So here is the connection probability. It's, a, it's similar to long range percolation. So the only, so long range percolation had P times beta over uh, the, the two vertices uh, norm raised to a D chopped off at one. The only difference now is that I multiply uh, the numerator here by the products of the two marks 
of the vertices. And of course, there's the long range parameter that raises this ratio to the alpha. Okay, so why the product? It's not necessary. A symmetric function is good because we want to have an undirected graph. So there are alternatives. And for instance, one alternative is to work with the maximum of the marks or uh, maybe even the minimum of the mark multiplied by the minimum of the marks to some power uh, sigma. So this uh, you can find in our paper. Uh, okay, so maybe I will talk a little bit about the role of these vertex marks. As I said before, WU, this is the expected degree of, uh, of vertex U, as long as the mark distribution has finite um, uh, mean and the long range parameter is larger than one. Otherwise, every degree happens to be infinite. So if we set power law or Pareto vertex marks, that will reflect uh, to Pareto degree distributions. So the decay is uh, the degree of origin being larger than K. This will decay as K to the minus tau minus one, which, opa, yeah, sorry, tau minus one, which you get by integrating the density. Okay, so looking at this picture, you see really that there are uh, these vertices that have lots of lots of degrees. If I go back, there was another picture somewhere. This one, if you see this one is also uh, that model. Oh, yeah. Uh, here also there is uh, one vertex that has enormously high degree, while most vertices actually have low degree. So this is uh, what Pareto distribution does. There's outliers. And these play an important role. Okay, so the question that we want to ask, okay, we have these nice inhomogeneous models now, long range percolation and geometric inhomogeneous random graph. And we can ask the same questions. Is there low of large numbers for the largest component in a box? How does the second largest component uh, behave? And are there large deviation results for the giant? Okay, so the question is, where does really this exponent d minus one over d come from for, for percolation and how does it change in these inhomogeneous models? And the intuitive idea of d minus one over d is called surface tension. This comes from physics. When you have a, a, you know, a ball of water, the surface area is uh, d minus one over d, a drop of water. So here, we, if, we, if I take a box of volume N and I look at Bernoulli percolation and I count, this is a very bad drawing, but if I count the number of edges crossing the boundary of this box, I'm gonna find roughly N to the D minus one over D many crossing edges. So this I call the edge boundary. So the edge boundary is the number of edges crossing a box of volume n, edge uh, boundary. And then, but I can ask the same thing about vertices, the number of vertices with an edge that crosses the boundary. This I will call the vertex boundary. And what we notice that in Bernoulli percolation and actually also in long range percolation, the edge boundary and the vertex boundary have roughly the same order because every degree is, is constant, is in expectation. So let's count for long range percolation. So this is for long range percolation, uh, the, this edge boundary. So from short edges, I get a contribution of N to the D minus one over D edges crossing the boundary of the box. Uh, and if you count how many long edges cross the boundary of the box, well, the volume of the box is N. You can roughly, if you go roughly of uh, to, to some neighboring boxes, you get an extra order N, and then the connection probability to those neighboring boxes is N to the minus alpha. So you get to N to the two minus alpha crossing edges 
that are of the same order as the box size. And actually, so if you have a box and then the edges that have roughly the same length as the box, there's roughly n to the two minus alpha of them. So here is our first main theorem for long range percolation on ZD or on RD, whichever you want. And we fix alpha larger than one. And we ask about the cluster size decay. So just the probability that the origin is not in an infinite component and it has a larger, its component size is larger than K. This is decaying stretched exponentially as before, but the exponent is no longer just D minus one over D, but it can be also two minus alpha, whichever is bigger. So it's K to the two minus alpha if two minus alpha happens to be larger than d minus one over d, and otherwise the surface tension stays and is d minus one over d. And I forgot to say the main condition that of course the model needs to be super critical. Okay, so this is one main theorem. And here we already see that the cluster size decay changes I will state some corollaries of the implications for the second largest component. But first, I want to talk about what happens of the cluster size decay in geometric inhomogeneous random graphs. What we can notice on this picture, I'm going to zoom in, that this vertex here has an enormously high degree. So if my box happened to be this red box, and I'm going to count the vertex boundary and compare it to the edge boundary of this box, most of the edges that cross actually gonna come from this vertex or maybe another few of these big vertices. So the vertex boundary is much, much smaller than the edge boundary. So there's only a few vertices that contribute a lot of crossing edges. And this means that if I want um, a component to be a large, but not in the infinite component, I can somehow play with how many of these high degree vertices this component should have or could have. So let's count the growth of the vertex boundary. As before uh, in, uh, well, let me write it, in geometric inhomogeneous random graphs. So as before, we get a contribution of n to the d minus one over d from short edges that cross the box. So just these ones here. And then I have a long a contribution of n to the two minus alpha from the long edges that cross the box, but where both endpoints are low mark vertices. So the mark is not really playing a role. But then if I want to count vertices which, which have this phenomena that you saw in the picture, that they, they really have high degree, but what does it mean to have high degree? So I'm gonna define a new parameter gamma. So N to the gamma is the minimal mark in a volume and box. So in a volume and box, asymptotically as N tends to infinity, such that if you put a vertex of this mark and to the gamma at the center of this box, uh, then this vertex gonna be connected to the outside of the box by an edge of two with positive probability. So it's strictly positive as n tends to infinity. So uniformly. So you, this can be made precise by taking the limb soup uh, uh, as n tends to infinity. So there is a little computation to compute this gamma, and it happens to be this uh, beautiful formula, one minus one over alpha over two minus tau minus one over alpha. But then if we count the vertex boundary, all these vertices typically have at least one edge or you know a Poisson number, uh, of many edges to the outside world. So a linear proportion of these vertices will contribute to the vertex boundary. So you can compute 
that uh, then in one box, so the volume of the box is n, that gives you n to the one, and then this minus gamma times tau minus one is the probability that the vertex has mark larger than n to the gamma. So this is the number of vertices with mark above this spe specific gamma. And then if you plug in now this gamma, then you get a new exponent, uh, which uh, I'm going to call zeta. It's 3 minus tau over 2 minus tau minus 1 over alpha. doesn't really matter what it is. Maybe what is noteworthy that it depends both on the tau, this is the mark distribution, and also on alpha, the long range parameter. So somehow geometry, alpha, and marks, which is uh, in homogeneity, both play a role. OK. Uh, and because we counted three types of edges, uh, short edges, long edges uh, on constant mark vertices, and these vertices with high mark contributing to the vertex boundary, uh, the vertex boundary is, of course, n to the maximal power among the three that we computed, which is d minus 1 over d. Then I have 2 minus alpha for the long edges. And then I have this uh, 3 minus tau over 2 minus tau minus 1 over alpha for these high degree vertices. OK, so actually, it turns out, and this is what we prove, that this is the right quantity. If you want to gen generalize the questions for Bernoulli percolation, the vertex boundary is the right thing to look at. So the theorem is that if you consider geometric inhomogeneous random graphs on RD with parameters so that alpha is larger than one, so I want to exclude infinite degree, tau has to be between two and three. Why? Because I want this guy here to be positive. Uh, and then the cluster size decay so the probability that the origin is in a component which is larger than k, but not infinite, decays stretched exponentially with exactly this exponent. So it's e to the minus some constant times k to the zeta star, where zeta star is just the maximum of these three quantities. And let me say that we have some conditions improving this. So for the lower bound, we can prove this uh, all three exponents. And for the upper bound, we need that either the long edges or this inhomogeneous uh, exponent uh, is the dominant one. So the surface tension is not the dominating term, which is OK, because we were interested anyway in inhomogeneous graphs with long edges. So it's uh, natural to assume that at least one of them uh, is the dominant. OK, so what are the direct color rallies? So I started with cluster size decay, and it might have seemed a little bit off. But actually, it gives a direct color corollary about the second largest component. Why? Because you can take a union bound over all clusters in a box and uh, use this decay to show that the second largest component has order log n to the one over the exponent you got. So for the theorem on long range percolation gives that the second largest component is log n to one over either d minus one over d or two minus alpha, whichever is bigger. And here, the only condition is that alpha is larger than one. So we want, we don't want infinite degrees. So there's also a consequence for um, about large deviations for the giant, which Joost will talk about. So in the remaining time, I will give you some proof ideas. And I cannot talk about everything. So I will focus on what I find the most challenging. And this was the upper bound uh, of the cluster size decay and second largest component for geometric inhomogeneous random graphs. So this is really where you have to have three exponents competing. So the big picture of the proof is that 
I'm going to approach the cluster size decay via the second largest component. Then I have an extension method uh, by consecutive boxing to have the cluster size decay for the infinite model. So before I start, let me just show you this picture. I zoom in and you can see that this is, this is the cluster of the origin and it has some long edges. And this is the second largest component and it also has quite some long edges, which means that um, combinatorial arguments often fail because um, these components are uh, delocalized. There's uh, lots of long edges. Um, so to deal with this, uh, the combinatorial explosion of, uh, of component counting, we, we come up with, with a different approach. So somehow, step one, we ensure that the giant component is everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean on a scale of k. <laughs> on a scale of k, because I'm I'm looking at the cluster size decay. So I have this k in mind that the probability that zero, um, that the component of the origin is larger than k, but not infinite. So this is my k. And what I do is I start with a volume and box, and I'm gonna subbox it. So I'm gonna subbox it so that every box has volume k. And I'm going to label these boxes B1, B2, B3, and so on. So this is B3 consecutively. So B4, let me just finish B5, B6. This is going to be B7. So cons every the labeling is consecutive uh, with a attachment. And we have seen that in the vertex boundary, there is this magic exponent, gamma, which are the vertices that typically already have an edge outside the box um, on the same scale as the box um, box size. So I'm going to call V star the vertices with mark in a constant time scale to the gamma uh, range. And I will allow here a factor two. So then it's a little bit of counting how many each of uh, these subboxes have of these star vertices. So the, the volume of the box is K, and then the probability of having a vertex above this uh, weight or mark is K to the minus gamma times tau minus one. So you get to exactly our magic exponent K to the zeta. So now you can do a Chernoff bound that the probability that uh, there is a box, actually there is a sub box where you see too few of, of these uh, star vertices is n is less than n times e to the minus uh, theta k to the zeta. So now every single box, so every box with this error probability has um, at least some constant times k to the zeta uh, star vertices. Okay, so then you do a little bit more of a computation. What happens inside just a single box? And actually, I'm just focusing on box one. So in box one, uh, the probability that two of these uh, star vertices with weight k to the gamma connect to each other it's a little computation using the connection probability is some constant. This you can tune by uh, choosing the constant prefactor on the on the weights uh, is larger than uh, lambda over k to the zeta. So then we notice, OK, this is for every pair. So there's a constant times k to the zeta many vertices, and they connect with lambda over k to the zeta each of them. So inside box one, you have on the star vertices an Erdős-Rényi random graph, or you can dominate below by an Erdős-Rényi random graph. So then you use, uh, we use a result by, uh, I didn't write the reference, uh, Yoast O'Connor, right? Yes. Um, 98. 98, thank you. Uh, that uh, the giant in a box of Erd so 
an Erdo Schrenyi random graphs, largest component, satisfies a large deviation uh, where the probability that this is, let's say, half of what it should be is e to the minus some constant times k to the zeta, the number of vertices. So this is a one error probability, which is good because here I already had n times that, so I'm fine. So what do we do next? So in the first box, we found this giant. And the other in the other boxes, I'm not going to build a giant. I'm just going to use my k to the zeta vertices in each box to connect to the giant of the previous box. So a similar argument shows that uh, box two contains, again, some constant times k to the zeta many vertices that connect to the giant that we built in box one. And then K uh, box three also connects to the vertices that connect to box one in box two. And so you have this sequential connection where you build one component gradually using the fact that we labeled boxes consecutively. So this I call the backbone. And when you connect every box, each box, you, you have an error probability which is um, e to the some constant times k to the zeta. So you take a union bound and then we build a backbone with this error probability again, which is good because this was also our error probability of having these star vertices. So ultimately where we are at uh, that we build this backbone which spans the whole box of volume n uh, where everywhere and every single box contains of this backbone a constant times k to the zeta many vertices. So really this backbone is a proxy for the giant. It doesn't have linear size yet, but if many things connect to it, this is the candidate for the giant. Okay, so what do we do in step two? Step two is very simple. We reveal all low mark vertices. And what I mean low mark, well, just below the threshold for being a star vertex. So vertices of mark below the, the star, uh, the backbone. Okay, so, so this uh, here, what you can see here, this, this blue thing is supposed to be the, black, uh, the backbone and the red thing, uh, the low mark vertices. Okay. So now we still haven't revealed vertices above, with mark above the k to the gamma. So the star vertices had mark, this I used all of them to build the backbone, k to the gamma and 2k to the gamma. And what happens above this? So if you have higher mark. Well, the problem is that not every vertex above this mark connects to the backbone. So there are vertices, I call it the trouble zone. Uh, the tr so K to the eta is the mark which is minimally necessary that all of those vertices connect to the backbone. Unfortunately, this trouble zone is not empty. So if you have a vertex here, it can happen that it just doesn't connect to the backbone. What does it do then? It might connect two clusters of vertices of low mark that have both sides less than K, but just barely. And then it connects them up to a large component. So that would be pretty bad for us. So we wanna avoid this. This, this is called a merger vertex and we don't like them. So how do you avoid or control the probability of these merging events? And, and this is how we, we dealt with it. So even though these merger vertices, so, so vertices above mark K to the gamma, not all of them connect to the backbone, but every single one of them connects to the backbone with probability at least a half. So we can use this. We can use this because of course, so this is where our method is specific to Poisson point processes. Um, the vertices above mark 
two times k to the gamma form a Poisson point process with a certain intensity. And we know that at least half of them with every one of vertex with probability one half connects to the backbone. So we realize this as two different PPPs where we half the Lebesgue intensity. So one of them will have half times Lebesgue and the other one will also have half times Lebesgue. But these, I'm gonna pre-sample randomness to ensure that the first PPP will connect, these are contained vertices that for sure connect to the backbone. And for the other ones, the unsure vertices, I don't know. And how do I do this? Well, hopefully here, no, I did not write it down. It's because we, I, in every box, uh, so every box, I know exactly how many backbone vertices are. I can use only the first K to the zeta of them and, and, and pre-sample the some part of the randomness of the edges of a, of a trouble zone vertex towards the backbone vertices in its own box. So I can do this and I can subdivide the PPPs into two, the union of two Poisson point processes where one of them for sure will connect to the backbone and for the other half, I don't know. Okay, so now in my third revealing step, I'm gonna reveal the graph spanned on the low mark vertices. So the, the red ones here at the bottom and the unsure vertices. And the, these about this, you know nothing. So it could be that they merge a few components. And in the last step, uh, we reveal the sure vertices and we wanna now use them to eliminate every cluster that in the previous step happens to be of volume larger than K. So goal, use Xi shirt to eliminate uh, vertis, um, components larger than K, but not the backbone um, with error probability less than n to the e to the minus k to the zeta. And I'm over time, so I'm just gonna give a little bit of an idea how we do this. So if we look at the component and we're gonna use a volume-based bound. So we put a unit volume ball around each point of the component. There will be intersections, but if this unit union of unit balls has volume larger than some constant delta times k, so delta is some small constant, then you can use the properties of Poisson point processes to count how many sure vertices fall into, into this volume here. So in, in the union of these balls, and there's because the volume is k of a constant times k, there's gonna be k to the zeta roughly constant times k to the zeta vertices falling in this volume. So you get the right error probability. And these vertices are very close now. So these short, short connectors. So they're going to connect to these uh, vertices with probability uh, p, each of them. So every vertex has at least one vertex close to it. So you have one, one minus p probability of not connecting and you have k to the zeta independent trials. So here you get the probability of not connecting. Um, so not connecting this vertex to a sure connector is also the right order. So what, does, what happens if a sure connector vertex connects to this component? Well, the sure connector vertex also connects to the backbone. So then this component merges with the backbone. So let me write it down. C merges with the backbone. And then if you take the union bound over all components, then you get the error probability N times E to the minus K to the zeta, which is exactly the right error. So, and here I have my very last unfinished slide. So if the volume 
happens to be less than delta k, which can happen if your cluster is very densely packed. What do you do then? So then what we do is we use this dense property locally of the component to allocate, a, we call it a cover expansion. So we allocate a larger set, maybe it looks like this, cover of C, where the following property holds, if a sure connector vertex falls into this set, even though it's quite far to every one of these vertices, there's so many of them densely packed that the probability that the sure connector vertex um, connects uh, to the cover, uh, sorry, connects to, to C, it's not even correct, is at least P over two. So then we can use this to mimic the previous argument and uh, connect a densely packed component also to the backbone. So to summarize, so the summary is that the probability that um, there is a component um, C, which has size larger than K, but not the backbone is less than n times e to the minus k to the zeta. So here, if you plug in k being log n to the one over zeta, you immediately get the size of the second largest component being less than log n to the one over zeta. And then we have this extension method which is basically a sequential boxing argument and a truncation argument to put, to get rid of this n and to have that actually zero is in a component larger than k, which is not infinity, is less than e to the minus some smaller constant times k to the z. All right. And then I with this, I finished all my proofs and I even went, five minutes over, so I apologize. Um, so I uh, I hope you enjoyed this part because Yoast gonna tell you how to use these methods to extend this to also large deviations for the giant component in a box. Thank you very much. <laughs>